second, and I'll get one out of the back closet for you. No worries. I oh. <laughs> we'll get started in just a second. Just had a couple things to take care of here. I'm going to jump right in. Big skills today. Old. I'm not real sure how effective they'll be. Okay, good morning. Happy Monday. Only one more Monday to go in class. We're getting there. All right, anybody have any questions on chapter five and six tests? Anybody have any questions? No? All right, let me get your scores. Jessica? Thank you. Gianna, Cheryl, thank you, Ashley, thank you, Ashley, do you have one, two, and three for me? Thank you, Jacqueline. Okay, Gabriel, Kayla, Lindy, thank you, Paula, thank you, Dwayne, thank you. Do you have two and three for me? That's fine. Faith? Okay. Faith, do you have um, one, two, three, or four for me? Thank you. Roque? I completed chapter five. Uh, I got a 95 on that. I'm not done with six. Thank you. Griselda? Lewis? Yes. Okay. And Rebecca? All right. Any questions on um, anything that you read in chapter five or six? Any questions? I want to talk to you just really briefly about dementia. Um, with um, You're going to have dementia patients, you know, throughout your career. It's important to understand that when you're working with dementia patients, it requires a lot of patience on our part because the connections in their brain just aren't connecting. Good morning. So a lot of times we talked a little bit about the factory, right? The memory making factory. You guys remember that? Okay, so a lot of times your dementia patients will ask the same question over and over and over again, and it's because the answer that you're giving them 
isn't going into their memory. They may be hearing you. They may even understand you, but they're not able to retain that information. So somebody may say, is it lunchtime? And you say, not yet, 20 minutes. And about three minutes later, this, is it lunchtime? It's not because they're trying to give you a hard time. Now, I know that children do this to get under our skin, right? This is, um, this is actually a method that children use to um, learn boundaries and establish a little bit of control, okay? If they can manipulate your uh, feelings and emotions and get you to get aggravated, that's actually control for them. And it's an important part of learning how to work with others. So children do this and get under our skin. With dementia patients, they're not doing it for the same reason. They're not trying to exert control. They're not trying to learn anything and they're not trying to get under our skin. Their memories just aren't sticking. So it's really important that you understand that they're coming at this from a totally different place. Now, with um, elderly patients, especially with dementia, it's important not to argue. Um, a lot of patients will say things that maybe aren't true. Like, um, I'm, my husband is coming to pick me up. That's a very common one. I'm waiting for my husband. He's coming to pick me up. I'm going home. It's very, very common. They th because where they are is a strange place to them. It's not home. Maybe where they're living right now, but that, that's not where their brain considers home. So if I'm here, I must be obviously waiting to go home, right? Because it's an unfamiliar place. So this is very, very common. Well, if you argue with them, oh, no, this is where you live. Imagine me telling you today, this is now where you live. This room. All of you guys live together. You live right here in this room. Is that true? No. Not to you. <laughs> if I try to convince you that this is now where you live, some of you are going to become hostile because that goes against everything in your being. This is not where I live. I have a home. I have people who depend on me. I have life outside of these walls. And you may start to argue with me. Now, if I try to convince you, this is where you live now, we're not going to get anywhere. We're just, everybody's going to be all upset and this didn't accomplish a thing. So don't argue with dementia patients. It's always better to redirect. You don't want to play into their um, delusions. You don't want to reinforce them, but you don't want to argue with them either. So I wouldn't say, Something like, oh, yes, let's go to the window and watch for your husband. That's not going to help. What would help is redirection. Get them involved in something else. Distract them. And then that feeling of waiting may go away. Make sense? So there's two things that I use um, on a pretty consistent basis when I was working in memory care. With females, females are very visual. And a lot of times, if I needed to buy some time, I would hand a female dementia patient a magazine, like a Good Housekeeping or one of those women's magazines. And I would tell them, I've lost my teddy bear. Somewhere in here is a teddy bear. Can you find the teddy bear? Now, a teddy bear is something that's usually very comforting, uh, something from childhood that they rem remember. Old memories stick the longest, right? So most people know what a teddy bear is. And in every single one of those magazines, thank God for this, there is a snuggle ad with a teddy bear, right? Snuggle fabric softener. Mm -hmm. So in every single one of those magazines, there is a teddy bear. And a lot of times I can get the dementia ladies to flip through the magazine and try to find the teddy bear. Okay? So it buys me a little bit of time. Men aren't going to do that. They are just not going to flip through a magazine. They're more tactile. So men have to do. Um, so for men, if I need to buy some time, I have a shoe box that's filled with jasmine rice. Now, raw rice, not cooked, but jasmine rice because it's a very soothing scent. 
And inside this shoebox are nuts and bolts and marbles. And I'll tell him, I've lost my marbles. I need you to help me find them and help him try to find the marbles. If he picks up a nut or a bolt, we're going to say, no, that's not right. Let's find the marbles. This can help redirect, especially negative behaviors, but it gives them something tactile to do as well. Um, years and years and years ago, way back in the like late 80s, early 90s, there was a nursing home up. It was north of, of us on 19 somewhere, you know, somewhere like northern Florida. And it was they built this really unique nursing home. And the nursing home was kind of in a circle, like a wagon wheel. Good morning. The middle section, which would be like the hub, that was the dining area. And then the nurses' stations were in the, the spokes. And then the outer ring were all the patients' rooms. Well, in between those spokes were gardens. And they had raised garden beds. And the patients actually went out and planted and weeded and tended and harvested and the patients had a little prep area in the um, dining room that they could clean the vegetables. And these patients, because they were engaged in what they felt was meaningful activity, they were contributing to the whole, were on less medication and generally had a higher quality of life because they felt like they were important. They felt like they were part of a community. Imagine how frustrating it would feel if you get through your entire life and nobody wants you anymore. Nobody cares. Nobody visits. Nobody calls. The staff does absolutely everything for you and won't let you do anything. And you're just literally sitting there waiting to die. How do you think that would affect your psyche? You need to feel like you're part of something. And this is why in long-term care facilities, we have activities and we have resident councils and we have, um, we stress interaction between staff and um, patient so that the patients feel like they're part of a community. If you go into long-term care, especially with dementia patients, and you start treating them like they're an imposition, if you don't involve them in their care, they will literally give up and die. It's called failure to thrive, and it is a real thing. And it's a lot of the times because of how we treat the patients. So you've got to be really, really careful when it comes to dementia patients. You need to talk to them. I don't care if they understand what you say. Their understanding has no place in this conversation. You still need to communicate with them. And I've had a lot of CNAs in my career that use that as an excuse. Well, no, I don't talk to her. She's got dementia. She doesn't understand what I'm saying. Okay, but she's a human first. Dementia is secondary. You don't treat a human like an inanimate object. So we've got to be really, really careful in how we approach dementia to make sure that we're not um, causing issues in our patient's ability to thrive. Does that make sense? Good. So that's what I really want you to take out of chapter five is that they're human first. The human happens to have dementia. We're going to treat the human. Good? Does that make sense? Um, I've seen some, some really sad justifications out there. Um, and it only hurts our patients. Okay. One other thing that I want to point out is that, you know, we've all heard these stories, right, of these... Um, medical caregivers behaving very badly. Like we had one I'm going to tell you about on Wednesday who, um, because he did not understand incontinence, he felt disrespected. 
and beat a patient to death. Yeah. Yeah. We had another one that um, took a tire iron and beat two patients. One of them actually survived, um, beat their heads in uh, because he felt that they were being rude to him because they didn't respond the way he felt they should. I could go on and on. The, the, these stories are in the news all the time. CNAs that stand around and laugh at a patient who is gasping for breath as they're dying. Understand that the more inhuman you treat your patients, every time you do that, you lose a piece of your own humanity. And it, these issues don't start out of the gate. This, it, this wasn't the first time that these people misbehaved with patients. They didn't pick up a crowbar and just decide to beat somebody's head in right now. This happens step by step. You start by not communicating with patients, by dehumanizing them, by getting away with small activities, pinching patients, slapping patients. Guys, this happens out there. If you are a caregiver and you suspect that this is happening, do not turn a blind eye. Because if you let this happen, the next thing you know, they're going to pick up a crowbar. Okay? But I don't want you to um, confront these people either. That's not your role. I don't want you to go and say, Roque, I noticed that, is it Roque? Is that right? I noticed that you're pinching this patient. Please stop doing that. That, that's, that is not how we handle this. We handle this by going to our supervisor and letting the supervisor know what we see, what we hear, what we feel, what, you know, you need to give them all of the information to let them address it. Does that make sense? This doesn't happen overnight. It is a series of events that lead to catastrophic results. And our dementia patients are the ones most at risk because they can't, they can't defend themselves. And a lot of times they can't even identify that they're being abused. So it's up to us to make sure that we're doing the right things and keeping our patients safe. Good? Especially with dementia patients. It, it just breaks my heart. All right. So let's go ahead and review what we've learned up to this point. This is going to be a really, really, really quick review. How do we know what to do with each patient? The care plan. We follow the care plan, the whole care plan, and What are we observing for? Changes, abnormalities, pain, anything that doesn't look right. All right. Who do we report those observations to? Okay. Every opening starts with a knock. Every, or I'm sorry, every skill starts with an opening. Every opening starts with a knock. Um, when we're working with patients, what do they need to know? Your name and title. Name and title. What we're doing. Yep. And then we need to get, yep. Once we've done all that, then we can close the curtain. Is that curtain clean? What do you want to do after that? wash your hands. Now that you've got clean hands, we're going to talk about supplies. Um, one of the supplies we have to decide on is gloves. Do we just wear gloves for everything? No. Why? No. Yeah, you stop paying attention. Absolutely. Uh, so how, how do we know when we should wear gloves? What are our three rules? Okay, so body fluids, personal skin, and non-intact skin. Good. Very good. Uh, make sure you remove those gloves correctly as well. Don't cross-contaminate. Um, if we're going to get supplies, we need a place to put them. We're going to use a barrier. When do we get the barrier? When we get all of our supplies? 
before. We want to get that barrier first. All right. Uh, one of the supplies we may think about is a privacy blanket. Hen uh, when do we need a privacy blanket? Uncovered or undressed. Very good. Remember that comfort and dignity are two of the most important care principles that we learn. We have to treat these people like humans. All right. So what can linens not touch? Uniform in the floor. Very good. Very good. If you remember that, linens can't touch a uniform and they can't touch the floor. That pretty much takes care of most of linen rules. If you don't use linens, though, what do we do with them? Do we just leave them in the room for later? Very good. All right. So we're going to toss them. Good. Put them in dirty linen. Patients have to be in the Middle of the bed at all times. So if we're going to turn a patient on their side, what do we need to do first? Scoot them. Do we turn them toward us or away from us? Away. away. We're going to remain behind the patients. Behind. Good. All right. Washing rules. We're going to learn a little bit more about this today. Um, but what do you not put in the basin? So Why? Okay, yeah, we need water for rinsing. Absolutely, absolutely. When we get water, what do we need to turn that faucet on? Okay, we're going to, it's going to be warm, but we need a paper towel. Why? Yeah, faucet's dirty, hands are clean. They don't go together. Yep, we need a, need a paper towel. Very good. Warm water, I heard that. Who else gets to check it? Patient. So time out here. Do you know who else is going to check out the, check that water temperature? The yes. The evaluators will stick their hand in that water to make sure it is, in fact, appropriate temperature. So don't fake this. For the test, you're really going to use real water. And you're really going to wash whatever it is you're washing. And they're going to check the water temperature to see if it is appropriate. Don't fake this. This isn't pretend world. You're really going to use water, and you really have to make sure it's the right temperature. Um, whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. Remember those three steps. Try not to get your surface wet. And if you're going to put lotion on, what do you need to do before you put the lotion on? What do you do after you put the lotion on? What? Okay, good. Very good. And we're going to get to uh, the last one um, in just a few minutes, actually. All basins are cleaned the same way. For the test, we're just simply going to rinse them, dry them, and store them. But remember that you can't touch the basin after you've rinsed it with your dirty gloves or dirty hands. You need a paper towel. Okay. Uh, we end the same end the scale the same way, right? We have to end the scale with clean hands and a patient that feels cared for and about, right? So, what are some of the C's of the closing? Can anybody give me a C? Clean environment, comfortable, call light, curtain. Okay, very good. Once you've got all of that out of the way, what do you want to do? Yep, clean your hands. If you have to document, when do you document in there? And then what do you have to do? Wash your hands again. A lot of hand washing going on. Absolutely. How many of you guys go shopping anywhere? Convenience store, grocery store, big box store, right? You're out and about, right? When you come home, do you wash your hands? Not all the time. Let's be real. Not yep, all the time. not all the time. Most people don't. In, in fact, most people don't even think about it. But remember that out in the community are all the pathogens that people are spreading around because that bottle of ketchup has probably been handled by about 40 different people. Now, in reality, pathogens don't hang out outside of the body for very long, right? We've talked about that. But it's a good practice, especially if you're going to be putting your hands up near your, your face to eat, drink, smoke, talk on the phone, whatever. You really should wash your hands after being in the community. It does help reduce the pathogens that come into your home. Okay. It's a good thing to think about going into flu season. 
which we are fast approaching. Okay. All right. So now that we know the principles, let's review the skills that we've learned up to this point, because you just had a whole weekend off. So I got to make sure you remember all this. Okay. So how do you brush your own teeth? Don't overthink this, right? So these steps for mouth care is the patient has to be in what position? Fully upright. What do we want to do for the clothing? Cover it. So protect the clothing. What can we use to protect the clothing? Anything. Yeah. Washcloth, towel, patient clothing protector, chucks. I don't care. Find something. Um, what do you have to do to a toothbrush before you put toothpaste on it? Wet it. Very good. And then you're just going to brush everything that you see, right? Top, bottom, front, back. After you brush, what do they need to be able to do? Rinse and spit as often as they need to. Guys don't use a lot of toothpaste. You'll be there rinsing and spitting for hours. Okay, little, little pea-sized amount of toothpaste is all we need. And um, when we leave the patient at the end of the skill, they should be clean and dry. Make sure you take that towel off of them. That step gets missed a lot in testing is, you know, because you're just trying to get the, you know, you get done with the mouth care and now you're just trying to get through the rest of the skill and, and hurry it up. People forget to take the towel off of the chest. So make sure that you take a look around. That's where that clean environment comes in. We really should be taking a step back, looking at everything and make sure there's nothing on our bedside table. The sheets are arranged properly. The patient looks good. That's what I mean by clean environment, okay? We also learned how to dress a resident, and we remember this by USA First. Anybody remember what USA First means? Undress strong arm first, and then we're going to dress the weak arm first. Very good. Uh, this, we are going to do pants, socks, and shirt. Doesn't matter what order. Knock yourself out. I don't really care. But if you start at the bottom and work your way up, it is a time saver. Because you want to put the head of the bed up to put the shirt on, right? Makes it easier. But you can't put the pants on with the head of the bed up. So if you start at the bottom, put the socks on, put the pants on while they're laying down, put the head of the bed up, put the shirt on, it really saves you some time. Let me tell you something about time management. You're going to have way more to do out there than you have time to do. That's just the reality of where we, the, the work environment that we live in, right? way more to do than you have time to perform. If you just, if you have, follow me here, if you have 15 patients, which is not out of the realm of possibility in long-term care, you have 15 patients and during the course of your eight hour shift, you spend an extra two minutes with each one of those patients. 20 seconds here, 30 seconds there, 15 seconds here, little bits of time for 15 patients, that's a half hour. That's your break. That's your break. That's how in healthcare people say, well, I didn't get a break today. Well, it's because you really weren't organized and we really want to um, employ economy of movement. So that, what we just talked about, with um, dressing a resident. If you put the head of the bed up, get their top dress, put the head of the bed back down. Remember how slow that bed moved? You are, you're wasting time. If you do that with every single patient, you could find yourself without a break. So understanding how to prioritize care and stay organized is super important in healthcare, okay? Use your time very wisely. Yes, yes. All right. So uh, when you're uh, dressing somebody, don't overextend or force movement, right? Don't break anything. You're going to see with her when you start practicing, her foot literally goes around. It is broken. It's a steel cable holding that foot in place. Steel cable, guys. She was a testing mannequin when we were a testing center. Somebody testing broke the mannequin. 
a steel cable. Takes a lot of force to break a steel cable. Yeah, don't overextend or force. Because if that was a person, what would have happened? Oh, yeah, we'd break them in all kinds of ways. Absolutely. All right. We also learned how to take a pulse. And a pulse is a measurement of how many times a heart beats over one full minute. Doesn't mean we always have to count for one full minute, though. How do we know when we have to count for a minute and when we can use a shortcut? The care plan, very good. We're gonna follow that care plan. All right, what is our normal pulse rate? 60 to 100. And when you're taking a pulse, it's better to use what part of your fingers? The tips rather than the flat part. Very good. And can anybody show me where a pulse is located, a radial pulse? Okay, very good. Just below your thumb at the bendy part. Don't be way up here. At the bendy part. All right. What finger can you not use to take a pulse? Your thumb. Your thumb. Good. All right. Hand and nail care. How many hands do we wash? There it is. Very good. Oh, I was hoping to trick you guys. You are too good for me. Yeah, it's whatever the care plan says. It may say to wash two hands because they've got two. It may say to wash one hand. It may even say to wash three hands on the rare occasion that we may have somebody with three hands. We're going to follow that care plan, right? But remember that this really isn't about getting the hand clean. It's about keeping those nails at a manageable length. By filing them often, we never have to trim them, okay? So this is a washing skill. Whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. We're going to clean under the nails with an orange stick. Um, what do we want to do with that orange stick before we move to the next nail, though? Wipe it. And when we file, how do we file? Yeah, always toward the middle, one direction. Very good. Making an occupied bed. Clean rolls toward me, dirty rolls away. That's how we change the sheets. Should the patient ever be on the bare mattress? No. Um, and to change the sheet, you want the patient on their side, but where in the bed do they need to be? In the middle of the bed. Good. All right. Uh, once you put the top sheet on, though, what do you need to do to the toes? Yeah, loosen it. Very good. Pull it up a little bit. Very good. All right, we're going to come back to that one. Sideline position. It's all about prep work here. The turn is easy, but it's about the prep work. So the furthest arm goes up, closest arm goes over, closest knee gets bent, foot flat on the bed. The furthest knee gets like, yeah, angled out. Very good, very good. If you get the patient in the right position, turning them, super easy. So, in fact, you got to be careful not to throw them off the bed because it doesn't take nearly as much force as you think it's going to. Okay. And then we're going to use a couple pillows. Where does one pillow go? Behind the back. That's the hard one. A second pillow goes between the, like specifically between which joints? Knees and ankles. Okay. Third pillow goes where? This is a tricky one. Okay, so that's the pillow that's already on the bed. So under the top arm. Yep. Right, right. Now, when you put that pillow under that top arm, what do you need to make sure it's not covering? Their face. Their face. <laughs> that is correct. Yes. Yeah, I know. That's kind of a, it can't be that easy, right? <laughs> Yeah, you want to make sure that top arm pillow isn't covering their face. And yes, we are going to adjust that pillow under their head as well. Now, for this skill, the um, call light needs to be placed directly in the bottom hand, the one under the pillow, which is a, a, a change from what you see in the video. Please make sure that you're aware of that. Um, foot care. We're not doing this to clean the foot. What are we doing it for? 
Yep. To look at the foot. Yeah. We're, we're looking for any abnormalities. What do we do if we find a, an abnormality? Yeah. All right. So this is something I didn't go over with you, but it's kind of important. If you see, if you're um, doing foot care and you see a big red spot between the patient's toes and the skin's kind of flaky and looks like something's going on there, please do not put their sock and shoe back on and then go get the nurse and say, hey, they got something between their toes. Because if they've got their sock and shoe on and they're down in the activity room, the nurse can't take a look. And that means you're going to have to go get the patient, bring them back, take their shoe and their sock off so that we can take a look. It's much better if you go to the nurse and say, hey, I see something between the toes. I'm, they're still open. Do you want to take a quick peek before I put their sock and shoe back on? I will absolutely walk down the hall very quickly. Take a quick look before you get that sock and shoe back on because it's saving you time and me. That's if you've got a good nurse. Absolutely. All right. Bed pan, all about the bed, not the pan. Emphasis on the bed. What position does the bed need to be in for the patient to use a bed pan? Upright. Upright. Absolutely. Please don't forget that. Um, you have to have the bed flat to put the bed pan under the patient, upright for them to go, and then flat to pull that bed pan out. What do you need to wear when you're touching the bed pan? Gloves, absolutely. Butt juice. All right, look how much you've learned. That's a lot of information, guys. I have a question. Um, in the, on the review sheet, it says to not carry the bed pan uncovered. I don't right. remember us. So that. we're going to take the chucks and the bed pan out together. And we're going to fold that chucks over the bed pan. There's two reasons for that. The first reason is nobody needs to see what's in there. That's kind of a privacy issue. You know, I love my husband dearly, but he does not need to see what's in the toilet after I use it. Right. Yeah. Well, you are a stranger and the roommate is a stranger and all the people out there are stranger. Nobody needs to see that. It's a dignity issue. It's a privacy issue. So we definitely want to cover that bed pan as we're transporting it because of that. Make sense? Yes. Okay, but there's another reason, and that's infection control. If you trip on your shoelaces and you go face first into this bed pan and it's not covered, it's going to be a very bad day in your world. And that does happen, guys. I mean, un, you know, unexpected events happen. So you need that bed pan covered as you transport it for infection control as well as privacy. Yeah, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of people forget that. They flush it. Oh, yes, they yes. Just, yeah, make sure you, yes, absolutely, make sure you flush it as well. Yeah. Unless there's something there the nurse needs to see. <laughs> Again, don't go to the nurse and say, man, I just emptied that bed pan and it was really, really funky. And the nurse says, okay, well, where is it? Well, I already flushed it. Okay, I can't go into the septic and take a look at what you saw. So if it's funky, make sure you let the nurse see it before you flush it. Okay. In fact, if it's funky and in the bed pan, don't put it in the toilet at all. Because once it goes in the toilet, we can't culture it. We can't take a sample. So if it's in the bed pan, leave it in the bed pan, let the nurse take a look. If it's in the toilet, because the patient used the toilet, don't flush. Let the nurse take a look. And then after she does, you can flush. All right. So let's move on and learn about range of motion. This is on page 78 of your skills book. We're going to start off easy today. Do <coughs> you guys remember range of motion shoulder? Did we go over shoulder? Yes. Okay. Remember we talked about flexion extension, which was up, down, right? Abduction, adduction, which was side to side. And we talked about rotation too, which wasn't done for um, shoulder. So how do we know what um, exercises we should be doing for each patient? Are all the care plans for range of motion going to be exactly the same? No. 
So we want to make sure that we're following that care plan. But the, to perform the skill is actually pretty easy. If you look here, um, I need to, sorry, guys, all my home people. There we go. All right. So if you look here, the steps are pretty easy, right? We've got the big four that apply to every single skill all the time. We're going to follow the care plan. We're going to do the opening, evaluate if we need gloves and do our closing. We do that for every skill. That never, ever, ever changes. So there's nothing extra here other than the skill itself. So let's learn a little bit about this skill. So if you go to... I don't have it in there. Oh, go to page 79. Oh, there it is, 79. I know I had it in here. Up at the top of the page, you're going to see the care plan. This care plan tells us to provide the following range of motion exercise to the resident's right elbow and right wrist. Flexion extension. So if you remember, flexion extension was up, down. This tells us the right elbow and wrist. So the right elbow flexion extension would look like this. Guys, elbow is a hinge joint. It only moves in one way. If you get an elbow to do anything other than this, you broke it. Guaranteed. It's a hinge joint. This is all it will do. Okay. So up, down, flexion extension. How many repetitions? Why? Care plan says. Then we're going to move on to the wrist. The wrist is also flexion extension, which is up, down, three repetitions. So this is going to look like they're revving a motorcycle. Three. That's it. Put an opening in front of it. Put a closing behind it. Now, I have to evaluate if I need gloves. Gloves are not based on the skill. They're based on the, yep, the patient what, who we're working on at that moment and what they've got going on. So if I'm doing range of motion on you, on your right elbow and wrist, you're fully clothed. I'm not touching any personal skin and you don't have any open areas, right? So I don't need gloves with you. But with you, you have a wound on your hand. I know that because you just asked me for a Band-Aid and it's on your right arm. So if I was going to do range of motion on her right arm, and that Band-Aid fell off, and now she has an open wound that I could potentially come into contact with, what do I need? Gloves. See how I'm going to evaluate that? Okay. So this is super easy. We're going to do an opening, exercise on the elbow, exercise on the wrist, closing. If you look at the bottom of page 78, if we go back there, Down here, you'll see somebody with your level of experience should be able to complete this skill in how long? Four minutes. That's an insane amount of time to do this whole skill. It really only takes maybe two. Maybe. Okay. So let me get somebody to, um, well, let's just review because I've got the slides up there. Okay, remember, range of motion is either active or passive. This care plan tells us to perform the skill. Remember that CNAs do exercises to retain function. Physical therapy regains function, not the same goal. So if we get ow, we're not going to go to the ow again. So if I'm doing flexion extension of the elbow and I get to hear and the patient winces or grimaces or tenses up or says, ow, the next one will go below the ow. And then I'm going to go find a nurse and say, hey, I got to hear and got ow and let them figure out what it means. It may not mean anything, but it could. And let me give you an example. There is a specific antibiotic that we give that can cause a hardening of the tendon particularly in the arm. And one of the very first signs of it is when you bend your elbow, it hurts. When it's never hurt before and you have difficulty straightening that elbow. 
So if the patient is on this medication and we're doing range of motion and we get an owl where we've never gotten an owl before, that could mean the patient is having a reaction to that medication. Good? Make sense? Okay. So we need to know that even little things, things that we don't think matter, you know, oh, he's old, he's just having a bad day, whatever, could actually mean something else is going on with the body. And because you don't know all of these little details, whatever you know, the nurse needs to know. Good? Make sense? Okay. All right. So let me get a volunteer, somebody to come over here and lay down in the bed for me. Okay. All right. Here we go. Hi, Miss Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Fantastic. I need to do some exercises on your right arm. Is that okay? All right. I'm going to close your curtain. Let me go wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. Now, after your first skill is done for the test, you are going to be told you can simulate hand washing. So simulate just means say, I am washing my hands now. My hands are clean. All right, Ms. Jones, I'm going to do all the work. All you have to do is let me know if there's any pain or discomfort as you do this, okay? Remember it said her right, not my right, her right. This is her right. But if I'm standing there facing her, it's opposite of me. Keep that in mind. All right, so I'm going to bend your arm up like you're making a muscle and then back down to the bed, and I'm going to do this three times, okay? So I'm going to put your hand palm up, and we're going to go up. And all the way back down. Feel okay? Remember, you always want to go to the start position. Up and all the way back down. That's two. One more. Up and all the way back down. Feel okay? All right. Now we're going to move on to the wrist. We're going to keep the elbow supported on the bed. We're going to make a loose fist. And we're going to go up and down like you're revving a motorcycle. So forward and back. You should feel a little stretch. Feel okay? Forward and back. Feel okay? One more. Forward and back. Good? Are you comfortable? Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> Let me check that care plan. <laughs> Here's the call light. If you need anything at all, just press that red button. I'll be happy to come back and help. I'm going to open the curtain, go wash my hands, think about the steps of my skill, make any corrections, tell the nurse we need Dunkin' Donuts, and my skill is done. Thank you. So easy skill right? Quick and easy. Those are some of the, the quickest skills that we have, all the range of motions. All right. So our important checkpoints here, let's see if I did this correctly. Did I support the extremity near the joints? Did I always make sure that elbow is supported? Did I lift extremities from below, not above? Remember, we're not the claw machine at Walmart. I move slowly and smoothly. Um, did I return all the way to the start position? Okay, flexion extension is what kind of a motion? Up, down. A um, abduction, adduction is what kind of a motion? And rotation is what kind of a motion? Around. And I'm always going to ask about pain and discomfort. So I'm pretty happy with that skill. I think I did pretty good. And that's how we're going to um, perform that for the state exam. All right, so we're going to move on to page 96. Now, this is a harder skill. This is a harder skill. All right, this is denture care. And when we're looking at this, 
Um, this is, remember when we did um, hand and nail care, there were a lot of supplies and a lot of steps, right? Um, but once we learned them, it, it you know, we kind of made the supplies make sense. This is going to be very similar to that. The steps and the supplies are going to be a little bit trickier with this one, primarily because some of these supplies you've never seen before and you don't know about yet. So this isn't going to be, it, it's, it's a little bit more challenging for students than hand and nail care, okay? Um, we have a lot of principles involved in this skill. We're going to follow the, yeah, every skill starts with the opening. Opening starts with a knock. We're going to evaluate if we need gloves. We have a supply, yes, supplies, so we need a, we're not going to let the linens touch. Yeah, uniform or floor. We're going to clean the basins the same way we always do, and we're going to end the skill with the Okay, Cl closing, yeah. We're going to put everything away, yep. Yeah, we're going to put everything away and end with the closing. So, yes, you're going to need paper towels to do that. So, we already know a lot of this, right? We already know a lot of these steps. What we want to focus on are the ones that we don't know. And that's what we're going to get into now. And this is going to take me probably about... 25 to 30 minutes to explain to you because I have a lot to go over. So stretch or yawn or whatever you need to do to stay awake for this one. All right. So if you want to see the care plan, it's going to be located on page 97 at the top of the page. And up here, it tells us a resident with dentures is sitting at an overbed table with their dentures in a denture cup. So let's stop there for a second. It's important for you to understand that CNAs do not put dentures in. CNAs do not take dentures out. That is not our role. The patient has to be able to do that themselves. If they can't, they simply don't use their dentures and we puree their food, chop it up really fine. Um, but we do not take dentures out. Now, the reason for that is because there's a very high um, likelihood that you will dislocate their lower jaw. Dentures are usually held in with denture paste, which is sticky, kind of holds the dentures in place. And if you are removing dentures from the lower jaw, if you're removing your own, you put your fingers all the way in the back and to the very back corners of the dentures, the very back, and you flip it up and forward. Now, you can do that because your leverage is correct, okay? Put your fingers back here, flip up and forward. You never put enough pressure on your lower jaw to dislocate it because it's you. But if I'm going to do this on somebody else, the leverage changes. So if I put my hands into somebody else's mouth and try to pop that lower denture up, these knuckles right here have to press down on the jaw to get that leverage, Otherwise, I have no leverage. So my knuckles pushing down on that lower jaw with my uh, fingers way back here separating that hinge joint can dislocate their jaw. Yeah. So we don't want to do that, do we? That doesn't sound like any fun. So CNAs don't put denture or don't take dentures out. CNAs also don't put dentures in because in or when you put dentures in the mouth, in order to get them to seat properly, the patient is going to bite down. That's how they push the dentures into the right location. And they've been doing this for themselves on their own. So usually when dentures go in the mouth, it's a reflex to bite down. Well, if you're putting dentures in somebody's mouth, where are your fingers? And they're going to bite down, which is a very high likelihood that you will get bit. Not that they're trying to. They're not trying to injure you. It's a reflex action. So CNAs don't take dentures out. CNAs don't put dentures in. Right. Good? Make sense? All right. It says the resident's denture needs brushed with toothpaste. Okay, stop there for a second. There are two ways to clean dentures, and we're going to talk about this in just a second. Two ways to clean dentures. 
What does this care plan specifically tell us we're going to do? Brush with toothpaste. All right. Says the resident also needs mouth care. Well, that makes sense, right? We're going to clean the teeth and the mouth they came out of. The denture is stored in a denture cup after cleaning, because remember, we don't put it back in the mouth. And the resident is not able to provide their own mouth or denture care. Now, if you look at the bottom of the page, you can see all of the supplies involved in this skill, and there are a lot. We're going to go through these step by step as we go. Some of them you're familiar with. Towel, washcloth, gloves. Some you're not. So this care plan specifically tells us to clean both the dentures and the mouth. Right? But that's routine. The care plan really shouldn't have to tell us that. It tells you that for the test because you're a newbie. But in a clinical setting, it's not going to tell you to clean the dentures and the mouth. It's just going to say provide denture care. You need to know mouth care is part of denture care. Okay. What happened there? Not sure what happened there. All right. So this skill is going to require two sets of gloves. One set to clean the dentures and one set to clean the mouth. And a lot of people kind of get a little tripped up here, right? If I'm going to do mouth care on you, what kind of gloves do you want in your mouth? Clean. If we've cleaned those dentures and we've, um, you know, been around the, the washcloth we're going to talk about in a minute and the basin and all of these supplies and everything, by the time we're done cleaning the dentures, are those gloves still clean? No. So we have to remember that we want clean gloves to do mouth care. We also want clean gloves to handle those dentures. Right? You wouldn't want somebody with dirty gloves handling dentures and then you're going to put them in your mouth. So dentures require gloves, mouth care requires gloves, and both sets have to be clean. Good? Make sense? Let's go back here for a second. I want to talk to you about the different types of dentures. This is something a lot of people aren't really familiar with unless you've had dentures. When we talk about dentures, usually we think about this, a full plate. It has replaced all of the teeth, um, full plate of dentures. This is what most people think about. But if somebody still has um, teeth in good condition, we're not going to pull, you know, good teeth to give them dentures. In most cases, we're going to work around the good teeth that remain, and that creates a partial. You can see the teeth that are replaced, and you can see gaps that fit around the patient's um, teeth that, that remain, Okay. So full plate, partial. And then we have bridges. Now, a lot of times bridges are now implanted, but we still have some patients, especially our older populations, that have bridges that are removable. Now, a bridge is not as big of, as a partial. It doesn't go all the way across. It's a little piece of a denture that just fills in one or two teeth. Okay. So all kinds of different types of dentures. We're going to clean them all the same way. Doesn't really matter. Um, we'll clean them all the same way. I need I need some gloves. Okay. So in here, I have two denture cups. You always need gloves when you're handling dentures. You don't need gloves when you're handling the cup, but you do need gloves for the dentures. I do not fit into small gloves very well. Oh, I'll get some next door. So these are two denture cups, and these are actual real dentures, guys. They haven't been used by real people, but they are real dentures. 
This is a full plate. This is what we talked about, a full plate. All of the teeth have been replaced. This is a top plate because it has a palate that's gonna fit up on the roof of the mouth. Then we have a partial here. You can see on the partial, you've got gaps that are gonna work around, oops, work around the patient's natural teeth that remain. So in here, when you're practicing, I have full plates. I also have a partial for you to practice with. Um, for those of you at home and those of you that can't practice in here uh, because of your schedule or whatever, we have a practice kit that you can purchase. The practice kit has everything in it that you're going to need to practice all of the skills. And one of the things that's in the kits are dentures. They're, they're fake dentures. They're not real. Don't try to put them in your mouth. <laughs> they're fake. Um, but it gives you a, um, a very good representation of how, you know, so, something that you can practice on. It's a little bit better quality than the vampire teeth that you get around Halloween, okay? They actually look like real dentures. All right. So you guys have these to be able to play with. Um, in the classroom. Those of you who are physically here in class, you get a discount on that um, practice kit while you're enrolled. That will end next Wednesday. Keep that in mind. All right. So remember, we need two sets of gloves. Now, there's two ways of cleaning dentures. One is toothbrush and toothpaste, and that's what our care plan is telling us to do. The other are fizzy tablets. You put the dentures in a cup of water, put the little fizzy tablets in. They fizz after uh, a little bit of time. You take them out and you just brush them off with running water and a, a little brush. This actually, believe it or not, works better than this. Um, and that's because toothpaste is abrasive, has abrasive particles in it. Now, on your teeth, that's okay because the little micro cracks that form from the abrasion, your body will fill in because teeth are, you know, still living. Fake teeth are not. So when you use toothpaste on dentures and little micro cracks form, that can allow bacteria to harbor in there. So it's actually better to use the bubbles. They break down the denture paste and the food particles much more effectively. Good. How do we know which method we're going to use? Care plan. Yep. And this care plan wants us to brush with toothpaste. Okay, no problem. We can do that. So now we're going to get into the supplies. And these supplies you may not be overly familiar with. The first is a denture brush. A denture brush is a double-sided toothbrush, kind of short and stubby. Double-sided uh, toothbrush. You've got a larger side that looks like a toothbrush that will be used on the teeth. The smaller side fits in the channel of the dentures. So it, it works its way in there and gets all that denture paste and food particles out of the channel. That's why denture brushes look a little bit funny. They have the two sides. And then we have a toothette. This is what we're going to use to clean the patient's mouth. You can use a toothbrush, but here's the problem. Dentures are held in by denture paste. That denture paste warms up with body heat. What's our normal body temperature? 97.6. Yeah, 98.6, roughly, if kind of. Um, 97.6 to 99.6 is considered normal. Because that denture paste has warmed up because of body heat, it's going to get stringy and sticky. Now, if you try to get that off with a brush, that stringy, sticky paste is going to get all wound up in the bristles of the brush. And it's not going to be overly effective. If you use this, which is called a toothette or an oral swab, you'll see it both ways, toothette or oral swab, this has different sides to it. So you can use it to swipe away the denture paste and the food particles and because it's a semi-solid surface, it does a much better job swiping away. It's also disposable, which means we don't have to try to clean that denture paste out of bristles. 
which is a very good thing. So this is a denture brush. This is a denture brush and this is a toothette. So I'm gonna pass these around. You can take a look at it. This is really spongy. Kind of looks like a lollipop, but it does not taste like one. They make them minty, which it's a really weird mint. Okay, so let's get into some important considerations. We talked about this with um, mouth care, right? We wet our toothbrush before we put toothpaste on it. We're gonna do the same thing with the denture brush. We're gonna wet the denture brush, put toothpaste on it. We're gonna do the same thing with the toothette. We're gonna wet the toothette and put toothpaste on it. That step never changes. Why we have to talk about this is because this skill has two parts to it. You have one part where you're taking the dentures to the sink and washing them. You've got another part where you're doing mouth care on the patient. So two parts to this. You heard that too? Yeah. Okay. Well, I was in the supply closet, so something may have fallen over. Uh, I thought y'all were simulating the mannequin move. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the supply closet. I, I, yeah, I know. Right behind you. <laughs> All right. So we have to take our dentures to the sink to wash them. And dentures, you're going to see in a minute, have to stay in the denture cup. So if I'm going to take that those dentures over to the sink to wash them, I don't want to be at the sink trying to fiddle with wetting a toothbrush or a denture brush, putting toothpaste on it. Where do I put the toothpaste? It's just a lot of chaos at the sink, not a lot of room. So you want to get this all prepared before you go to the sink. And you're going to, you can just set it down there. You're going to put, you're going to wet the denture brush, put toothpaste on it, and then you're going to put it in that emesis basin, that kidney basin, just to hold it. That's all that basin is going to do is hold our prepared denture brush. And that's because... We don't want it sitting on the side of the sink. Okay. We have to have a place for it to live. And it's just going to hang out in that, den in that basin while we get ready to do the rest of the skill. Make sense? All right. I'm going to tell you that I've been doing this for, I don't know, 15, 17 years, however long it's been now. This skill students struggle with a lot. Now, to me, it's a pretty easy skill because I've done it about a million times. But you're going to struggle with this when you first start practicing denture care. And this is one you do need to practice before the test. You don't want the first time you do this skill to be during the test. You're going to make mistakes. It's a big skill. Okay, so make sure you practice this. But students tell me that this is the hardest skill for them to kind of get under their belt. When we're cleaning dentures, we want to protect them. They're going to be wet. They're going to have toothpaste on them. They're going to be slippery. They're probably going to fall. We don't want them to fall into the sink where they may break. Dentures are expensive. You know, about three to $6,000 for a set of dentures. They're expensive. And they're not covered by insurance. This is paid for out of your patient's pocket. In most cases, if you go around breaking their dentures, the facility is going to have to reimburse them. What do you think is going to happen to your raise? <laughs> okay. So to prevent the dentures from breaking, we're going to put a washcloth in the bottom of the sink. And that provides a soft surface. So if the dentures should fall, they're not contacting the surface of the sink. But if you can get that washcloth over the drain, that's even better because a washcloth over a drain will allow water to pool up in the sink. And that way, if the dentures fall, they fall onto the water, not the washcloth, not the sink. Good? Questions? 
So we're going to use a paper towel to turn the faucet on because our hands are clean. We did our opening. We got our supplies. We're all ready to go. We got our tooth, our, our denture brush prepared. We're over at the sink. We're going to turn the water on, but we have to have a paper towel to turn that water on. Now, people get all mixed up with this. It does not matter whether you put your gloves on before you turn the water on or after you turn the water on. Nobody cares. Whatever you want to do, just remember, re either way, you need a paper towel to turn that faucet on. Okay, you can't touch it with your hand. You can't touch it with your glove. So it doesn't matter whether you put your gloves on before or after the water. Good? Good. We want to use cool water to clean dentures, not hot. Heat, there, there's a, a scientific principle. Heat coagulates proteins, which means absolutely nothing. But I will tell you, if you use hot water, whatever's on those dentures is going to be stickier and harder to remove. Don't want that. You want easy. Cold water is best. Okay? No hot. Make sure you wear gloves when you're handling dentures. Well, this just makes sense. <laughs> I'm not touching anybody's dentures without gloves on. But those dentures have to remain in your gloved hand. You can't set them down in the bottom of the sink. You can't set them on the side of the sink. You can't put them anywhere except the cup, your hand, or if you need to, the basin. Those are the only three places dentures can go. Your hand, the cup, or the basin that held the denture brush. That's it. Don't let, don't set them down in the sink. You know, um, back in um, April, I think it was, I went to HOSA, Health Occupation Students of America. I go to their state leadership conference every single year. I'm their celebrity guest. It's so much fun. People have me sign their shirts. I, it, it's crazy because they've been watching me all year. Um, it's tons of fun. Well, last year I actually judged an event and this is the event I judged, Denture Care. And it was very interesting to me because these people have prepared for this competition for months. This is a really big deal. And it can result in scholarships and all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's, it's a really cool thing. So they prepared for this. And I can't tell you how many times I saw people when I was judging this, holding dentures with their bare hands, putting them down in the sink, and um, it, the care plan clearly says the patient's sitting in a chair and cannot perform their own mouth care. They would get the patient to stand up and go over to the sink and brush their own teeth. It's a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> care plan? What care plan? So this is one of the reasons that I teach you the way that I do. Because any one of you could easily go to a competition and win just knowing the principles that we've talked about. The very first thing you would do is look at the care plan, right? Make sense? Okay. Remember, the first thing your glove should touch is the patient, or in this case, the dentures, which is a part of the patient. So we want to make sure that we've got all of our prep work done. That's why we uh, prepared the denture brush before we went to the sink, before we put our gloves on. Remember, the first thing your gloves should touch is the patient or the dentures that came out of the patient. Okay. So we're just going to brush everything we see. This denture, the, the denture care part is pretty easy. As long as you got a washcloth in the bottom, you're using cool water, you got gloves on, just brush what you see. Try not to drop them. Okay. Once you've uh, washed everything or brushed everything, you're going to rinse them pretty well. We've already talked about this. Don't set the dentures down inside the sink. Keep them in your hand. Keep them over the sink. Don't, you know, so if this is my sink, don't do this. That's wild. That washcloth is doing nothing for you over there if you're over here. So you have to be over the sink. I, why this is a checkpoint Makes me scratch my head. How many people were actually removing those dentures from the sink for that to become an actual checkpoint? 
I'm not sure. Yeah, I I don't know. Kind kind of a head scratcher. Yeah. So remember that dentures can only be held in your hand, the emesis basin, or the denture cup. That's it. That's it. Rinse the denture cup and fill it with cool water once we get those dentures clean because that's where they're going to live. This is where your dentures live. Dentures must be kept in water, not just the cup because they'll dry out, become brittle, and break. So dentures have to be kept in water. What temperature should the water be? Yeah, absolutely. So they were in water when we got this denture cup at the beginning of the skill. Do you think that water's clean? No. So what do you want to do before we put the clean dentures back in the cup? Yeah, rinse it out. We don't have to disinfect it. You don't have to soap it up. You know, Just rinse it out. Put some clean, cool water in it. Drop your dentures in. And then we always cover it with the lid. Okay? Good? Okay, so we're going to put those dentures back in the denture cup. We're going to cover it with the lid. And then we're going to turn that faucet off. Because remember, the faucet is still running. You water conservationists are going to have a really tough time with this skill because the water will run and run and run and run and run. And you can't turn it off during this skill because you need that water to rinse the dentures. And you don't want to touch that faucet with your gloves or your hands. Good? Make sense? So, yeah, it's going to be a tough one for you if you're used to turning water off. Let it run. When you're all done and your dentures are in the cup and the cup has the lid on it, then you can turn the water off. Okay. Once we do that, we're going to put our cup on a paper towel. Now, the reason is once you rinse this cup, it's going to be wet. If I put a wet cup on a surface, grandma will tell you all day long, you will warp that surface. What do you think housekeeping is going to do to us if we go around ruining the furniture that they clean so lovingly? <laughs> That's exactly it. They will. <laughs> that is exactly it. So that's why we're going to put a paper towel underneath that cup. It just acts as a coaster. And we're going to put the cup on the bedside table for the patient to use whenever they want to. Remember, you're not going to bring these dentures back over and try to force them into somebody's mouth. Okay. Good. All right. Now that we've got the denture cup on a paper towel on the bedside table, let's go back to the sink, wring out that washcloth, and put it in dirty linen. We don't need it anymore. Let's get rid of it. We're going to pick up that basin that's holding our denture brush and bring it back over to the table. Because denture care is only one part of this skill. What's the other part? Mouth care. mouth care. We're going to need that basin for the patient to spit in for mouth care. Okay. So we're going to bring the basin back over to the table, take the denture brush out, set it on the, the barrier on the table, and then we'll remove our gloves. We're done with dentures. Remove your gloves. After we remove our gloves, and that's what this is telling us. After we remove our gloves, we're going to get the patient ready for mouth care. So we're going to wet our toothbrush or our toothette in this case, put some toothpaste on it, set it in the basin. The basin is just going to hold it for a minute. And we're going to put a towel on our patient. We're going to do all of that before we put gloves on. Why? First thing your gloves should touch is the patient. patient. Yeah. Then we're just going to perform mouth care. I know. He hates this picture. <laughs> yeah, he hates that picture. So now we'll just perform mouth care. And you're just going to brush what's there. If it's just gums, brush the gums. If it's teeth, brush the teeth. Whatever they happen to have is what we're going to brush. Top, bottom, front, back, tongue. Make sure you let them rinse and spit. And then leave them with their face dry. Okay, good. All right, I'm going to show you this skill. I am going to show you the um, video for this because it has good close-ups of both the dentures and the mouth care part. So let me show you this one.
Hello. Hi, Mr. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Wonderful. I need to do denture care on you. Is that okay? Yes. I'm going to take your dentures to the sink. I'm going to close the privacy curtain and wash my hands. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm going to place a barrier on the table so we have a clean area to place the clean supplies. And then I'll gather the supplies that I need. We'll need a cup of water, a toothette, a denture brush, toothpaste, a basin, a washcloth and a towel, and two sets of gloves. Okay, we're gonna get the denture brush ready for use, so I'll wet it and apply a little bit of toothpaste to both sides. We'll allow the basin to hold that denture brush until we're ready to use it. I'll be right back, Mr. Jones. I'm going to go clean your dentures. Okay. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm just going to set your dentures over here so that you have them if you should need them later. Okay. I'll place the denture brush on the barrier and now we'll remove these gloves. And we'll throw those away. <coughs> Do you mind if I place a towel over your chest? That's fine. This will help keep your clothing clean. Thank you. We're going to prepare for the mouth care portion of this skill. We'll take the toothette and wet it. Apply a little bit of toothpaste to one area of the toothette and apply gloves. Okay, Mr. Jones, I'm going to brush all surfaces of your teeth now. So in a moment, I'll need you to open your mouth wide so that I can reach the back teeth. Okay. Okay, can you open your mouth? Thank you. I'm going to brush the back on the bottom and on the top, both sides. Okay, can you bring your teeth together, please? Thank you very much. We're going to throw the tooth out away. And would you like to rinse? Good. 
Would you like another rinse? Yes, please. Another rinse? No, thank you. Okay. I'm going to remove your towel and we'll place this in dirty linen. We'll throw away the disposables. And now I'm going to clean your basin. I'll be right back. Okay. I'll place the denture brush and the toothpaste in the basin and open the drawer with the paper towel to store the basin and other supplies. I'll remove the barrier from the table and we'll throw this away as well. Now I can remove my gloves. Mr. Jones, are you comfortable? Yes, ma'am. Can I get you a magazine? No, thank you. Is there anything else that you need? No, thank you. Your call light's right there. If you should need anything, just let me know. I'm going to open your curtain and go wash my hands. Thank you. After washing my hands, I'll think about the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. All right, any questions on denture care? Can we put the illustration on the sink? Can we put a paper towel under that? You don't have to. No. The outside of any basin is never considered clean. That's just kind of a nursing principle. I know we put them back in the, the you know drawer, but it's the outside of anything in medicine isn't uh, considered disinfected. Okay. Good. Let's go ahead and take a break. Come back at a quarter till. We are right on time today. Imagine that.
she was I guess she was married to this lady. Uh-huh. And she took care of this for five years. Uh-huh. You know, and she just recently passed when she was forty. You know. Yeah. It's hard though. Story. One of my great names was another person. They're a good company. If any names is good as far as they starting out, they're pretty good just for all right, so here's a comment I want to talk about. Yeah. Debbie reminds us to wash our hands after the use of gloves. And Debbie is absolutely right. We do want to wash our hands after using gloves. But I think it's important to... Um, kind of talk about when we should be washing our hands. Remember that um, you can wash your hands as much as you want during the test. There's no problem if you want to stop and wash your hands. If you can't remember the next step you're supposed to do and you want to buy some time, go wash your hands. That'll work. But when we are working with the same patient, we don't have to wash our hands when we remove a set of gloves before putting a second set on. We need to wash our hands at the beginning of the skill before we touch our patient, and we have to end the skill with clean hands. Washing your hands in between is not required. So I do want to make that, uh, that um, clear. So yes, washing your hands after removing gloves, absolutely. We know we have to do that because pathogens can get through, but that hand washing can happen at the end of the skill. Okay, Remove, doing denture care, removing those gloves, getting set up for mouth care, putting new gloves on. You don't have to wash your hands in between those two. Okay, good. Questions? Okay, and then there was another one on here. Um, Gift of God asks, where are you teaching those students? So we are located in Spring Hill, Florida. Um, and I have a class full of actual real student people that are in here learning. And then, of course, I'm live streaming to you guys as well. So we are located in Florida. And one more. Benita says, I failed my skills. I messed up on respirations and side positioning. And we're very sorry to hear that, Benita. Uh, we do wish you uh, great success on your next attempt. Don't give up. Try again. But watch our videos, and they will help you um, prepare for those particular skills. All right, so we are going to move on to Ambulate with a Gate Belt. This is on page 66 of your skills book. This skill is a little bit easier in that it has fewer steps and a shorter time. So you'll see the time for this skill is only five minutes. Um, we know most of these. We know to follow the care plan, do our opening, evaluate gloves, and the closing. Shoe rules, we've learned two of these. We're going to learn the rest of them now. This finishes up all of our principles. Um, and then we've got some sp skills specific that we have to go over. So let's go to page 67 and read the care plan at the top of the page. So on page 67, our care plan tells us to ambulate the resident at least 10 steps. How far are we walking them? 10, 10 steps. Yeah, it's a return trip. So five steps in one direction, five steps back is all we need. Um, it says use a gate belt or transfer belt. Patient will be sitting in a chair at the side of the bed with shoes on. Remember we learned uh, last week that slipper socks are not enough. You guys remember that? Our patient already has shoes on, so we don't have to stop and put them on. That's a good thing. Patient is able to walk but needs assistance to stand. So that's, uh, that, those are our patient's limitations. So we're going to go over shoe rules now. This is the very last principle that we have to learn, and we already know the first two. 
We've talked about that last week. If the patient's feet hit the floor, we have to talk about their shoes. And of course, slipper socks are not enough. Remember that slipper socks do not protect against sharp injuries. They also get covered in pathogens, which then get into the bed with the patient when the patient gets back into bed. So slipper socks are not ideal. Anytime your patient's out walking around, they really should have shoes on. We learned that last week, and that's going to apply here as well. But we're going to learn some new principles with shoe rules, too. And we're going to learn specifically how to use the gate belt. Now, a gate belt is just a flat canvas belt. This is a gate belt. It is simply a flat canvas belt that has a buckle, metal buckle on one end and a free end on the other. That's it. It's like any other article of clothing. The tag goes inside, just like any other article of clothing. Does not matter whether the buckle faces this way or this way. Nobody cares. However you want to put it on is fine. But when you put a gate belt on, you want to make sure that it goes on flat around the patient's waist. You don't want it twisted. You want to make sure it's flat. So when you put this on around the patient's waist, not yours, I'm just showing you on me. When you put this on around the patient's waist, the free end goes through the first guard by the alligator teeth. So it goes right up through here, just like that. Now, the teeth tell you which direction to pull this to tighten it. See how all those teeth are pointing that way? I pull that way and it tightens. If I try to pull this way, nothing happens. I have to pull that way to tighten. We want it snug around the waist. We're going to put this on with the patient sitting. When we stand up, our torso elongates and we get skinnier. So we want this snug around the waist because when the patient stands up, it's going to become looser. But we don't want it so snug that they can't breathe. So we have to have a way of identifying if it's snug enough. And to do that, we're going to use four fingers. So we're just going to pull this until we can just fit four fingers between the belt and the patient. And then we have to lock this in place. So this free end goes through the second guard to lock it in place. This tail hanging down, if it's in your way, just tuck it up into the belt. Okay, good. To remove a gate belt, you take it out through the second guard, just like this. Now, if you try to pull it the way we pulled it before, it's just going to get tighter. And we can't pull it this way because it runs into those teeth and locks it in. So in order to remove a gate belt, you want to hold the tail in one hand and grab the buckle in the other and slide the buckle along the belt. When you remove this, don't slide it against the patient's skin. Listen to this. Do you hear that? That will cause a burn on the skin because of the canvas belt. So when you remove this, don't slide it against the skin. You either want to take both of your hands around the back and hold it like that, or you can loop it up over the patient's head. Just don't let this metal hit their head. So you want control of this, but don't slide it against their skin. Good? Questions? Okay, so we want to make sure that it's snug enough with four fingers. If you don't get this snug enough, what happens is when we go to lift that patient up, that gate belt's going to go up underneath their breasts or under their arms, or they can slip out of it altogether. So we're either injuring the patient or causing them to fall. Neither one of those is good. So you want to make sure that you uh, have that secured appropriately. So we know that their patient's feet must be on the floor. Um, we know they have to have shoes on when their feet are on the floor. But one of the things that they actually want to hear you say in the state exam is, are your feet flat on the floor? And that's because if we don't address this, um, your patient can have some pretty serious consequences. So let me show you what I mean. 
if I have a chair, you guys at home aren't going to be able to see. Let me see if I can put that down just a little bit. Ugh. Yeah, I know we're tilted a little bit, guys. I'm sorry about that. Not much I can do about that. Okay. So if I'm sitting in this chair, I'm short. I have short legs. Okay. If I sit with my back all the way against the chair, my feet do not go flat on the floor. I'm actually up on my tippy toes. If you try to lift me from this position and all I have are my tippy toes on the floor, I'm going to fall forward. So before you lift somebody, you need to make sure their feet are flat on the floor. Now, some of you have no problem with this because you have longer legs. But for me, you would actually have to have me scoot forward so that my feet are flat on the floor before you stand me up. Good? Make sense? So we actually have to say that out loud. Are your feet flat on the floor? They need to hear us address that. That way they know that we know that that's important. We're going to make our patient a partner. Now, we talked a lot about this this morning is, you know, communicating with our patients. We want to make them a partner in this. Never lift a patient if they don't know what's coming. We want to count this out. We want them to participate as much as possible. So we're going to count. On the count of three, I'm going to lift you to a standing position. One, two, three. We want to count it out. Make sure you're counting. That is a graded checkpoint. This one gets missed. It's probably the most missed step. When we're helping a patient to stand, there is a lot of things happening in the human body when you go from sitting to standing. Blood pressure, because of gravity, drops, right? A lot of blood falls down. Um, we can have some dizziness. We can have some weakness. Patients that don't have really good core strength or have a lot of weakness in their legs can get really wobbly and unsteady. This is a big change metabolically when we go from sitting to standing. You guys don't experience this because you're healthy. You can stand up and run right out that door for the Dunkin' Donuts that just showed up, right? You can, you have the ability to accommodate. But it's important to understand that if we're helping patients, they probably don't have the same level of ability you do. If they did, they wouldn't need us. So when we stand a patient up, we want to make sure that we give them a second to acclimate and that we ask, are you dizzy? Are you feeling okay? Everything good? You ready to walk? Any of those will work but you wanna give them a second to acclimate and make sure we're okay. Now, the main reason for that is if somebody stands me up here and doesn't ask and we start walking and we get to somewhere over here and I start to get dizzy, weak, I show signs that all is not well, what is your exit strategy? You don't have one because the chair is way over there. Now, what a lot of CNAs will do is they'll rush the patient back to the chair. Oh, my gosh, you're not doing well. Let's turn around and let's rush back to the chair, right? But the patient isn't tolerating a slow walk. What makes you think that they're going to tolerate a rush? You know what's going to happen between there and here? They're going to fall. And every CNA of the world will say, I don't know what happened. We were walking along. They got a little dizzy. Next thing I know, they're on the floor. Well, they're on the floor because you didn't intervene properly. If we get over there and your patient starts to show signs that something is wrong. Now, this, there's a lot of signs, right? Patients get pale or sweaty or they'll start to wobble, right? They may put their hand out for stability. They may even put their hand to their head or their stomach. They may slow down. They may even tell you, hey, I'm not feeling right. There's a lot of ways that they let us know that something is very wrong in their world. Pay attention to that. The biggest step for this skill is that you have to have eyes on that patient at all times. 
Where is your attention? If you are walking a patient and you see any of those signs, you need to stop and get the patient sitting on the floor right there. Don't rush them back to the room. Don't rush them to a chair. Don't leave them to go get a wheelchair. You stay with them and you get them sitting on the floor because patients that are sitting on a floor can't fall on a floor. And injuries happen when we fall. Does that make sense? So if I'm walking somebody, I'm always going to be slightly behind them and to one side, right? So my patient is here. I have the gait belt in an underhand grip from behind. They're leading. My focus is right here. Not on the TV at the end of the hallway, not talking to another coworker, and certainly not flipping through something on my phone. My attention is right here. Because if I see anything that looks funny, we're going to stop and I'm going to. The way we do this as we're walking, right, we're walking, they're slightly ahead, they get a little wonky on me. This leg gets planted right in between theirs. Pull them back with that gait belt to my body and slide them right down my body onto the floor. I'm going to use myself as a lever to get them sitting on the floor. Okay. And then I'm going to find a nurse. I'm probably going to send a staff member. Hey, go get the nurse. We got a problem. Now, we got lots of people we can help get that patient up off the floor. But the whole goal is not to let them fall. Good? Make sense? And that's counterintuitive. You may have a written test question that asks you, a patient that you're walking starts to complain of dizziness. What is your first action? A, hurry them back to the room. B, go get a wheelchair. C, ask another resident to get the nurse. Or D, get them sitting on the floor. Sitting on the floor is the right answer. Good? Make sense? All right. Anytime you sit a patient down, they have to know the chair is there. You do this, and you don't even realize you do it, but when you go to sit down on a chair, you feel that chair with the back of your legs. That way you know it's there before you sit. You don't even pay attention to the fact that you do that, but you do. Sometimes you might even have a hand on a chair, you know, as you're sitting down. But you are aware that chair is there. Patients that we are helping have to also know the chair is there. If their brain doesn't know that chair is behind them, they will unconsciously resist because they feel like they're going to fall. So when you're going to sit a patient down, you turn them around and have them back up until they feel that chair. And you're going to ask them, can you feel the chair behind you? Or let me know when you feel the chair behind your legs. And then we're going to help them sit. We help them stand using the gait belt. We help them sit using the gait belt. But they have to feel that chair behind them. Okay. Good. All right. This one's a little harder to explain. So if I'm sitting in this chair, you guys can kind of see this at home. Maybe if I back up one. Yeah, it's hard to do. All right, if I'm sitting in this chair, you can see there's a line on the, the tile in front of me. You guys see that line in front of me? Do you see the lines on each side of the chair? I am literally sitting in a box. There are lines that outline this box around me. I'm actually going to use that box for body mechanics. It used to be years ago. We train people to stand right in front of the patient, toe to toe, knee to knee, and lift them toward, you know, lift, lift the patient toward them. The problem with that is physics. So there's a physics principle that says every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if I have somebody sitting in this chair that's 150 pounds, and I am standing here, Lifting that 150 pounds toward me, okay? So I've got all of this action, 150 pounds coming toward me. That means that my back has to accommodate 150 pounds going this way. 
How long do you think it's going to be before I blow out every disc in my lower back? Yeah, not long. Not long. It also makes me off balance, which increases the fall risk for both of us. So standing in front of somebody knee to knee, toe to toe is not the right body mechanics way of lifting a patient. Instead, we're going to use that box. Okay. So if we've got somebody sitting in the chair and I've got a line in front of their feet, I'm going to put my foot across their feet perpendicular on that line. This foot is going to go parallel to their body, parallel to that line. Now I'm at the corner of that box. I'm going to reach around behind the patient, grab that gait belt, and I am going to bend at the knees, not the back. I want, to, I want my legs to do the work. So I'm going to bend at the knees, hold that gait belt, and on the count of three, one, two, three, we're going to stand. And that makes me way more stable, and it doesn't have all of that backwards pressure on my back. Good? So the body mechanics here count. You want to be at that oblique angle for better stability. When you put a gait belt on, it goes over the patient's clothing. I think this should be pretty self-explanatory, but we're going to have a slide on it anyway. Remember I said we were a testing center? So this is one of the things that one of the evaluators told me about on one of the testing dates. So this girl comes in to test. And we were a regional test, so people came from all over to test, not just my students. And she said, apparently, this girl had never seen a gate belt before. And she picked it up, and she looked at it, and she put it around the patient's chest like this. And then she thought, well, I don't think that's right. So she took it off, and she put it around her waist and had the patient grab onto it and try to stand up. And then she realized that wasn't quite right. So she took it off and she's thinking about it. And she tried to put it around both of their waists. And the evaluator comes out and she's telling me about this. She said, I had to stop it because I was afraid somebody was going to fall. It was a safety problem. So that's why I have this slide here. Okay, gate belts go around the patient's waist over their clothing. Good? I know. <laughs> I mean, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't imagine you sitting there like as an evaluator, like not laughing. Yeah. Uh, that's crazy. It's, it's a hard, it, being an evaluator is a hard job. I, I can't be an evaluator. And the reason is I'm an instructor. You can't be an instructor and an evaluator. You can't be both. You have to pick one. Well, I am a born instructor. I explain everything to the minute detail, okay? That's just what I do. If I see you doing something wrong, I want to stop you and explain why it's wrong and how to do it right. I am an instructor. So for me in the testing center, I would spend all day long trying to explain to people a better way to do what they're trying to do and we would get nothing done. Because where do those evaluators want to be? At home, in their pool, drinking their Mai Tais, right? That's where they want to be. So I'm not a good evaluator. I'm a much better instructor. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's a hard job to, to sit there and try to keep your mouth shut and not help them improve their practice. Yeah, I can't do it. All right, so when we're going to use the skate belt around the patient's waist to help lift them to a standing position, we want to hold around the sides or even the back of the gait belt if we can get our hands around that far, depending on how big your patient is. Um, you never want to be at the front of a gait belt lifting somebody. It's always the sides or toward the back because that's where most of our weight is. And we want to be lifting where the weight is. Now, it used to be years ago, we didn't use gait belts. We just grabbed patients by the arms you know, the back of the arms and try to lift them. Well, most of our weight is down here. So if we're grabbing up here, that means all of this is trailing behind. So we've got to put more force into it. So it takes more effort and we're gripping harder, which can injure the patient. So lifting by the arms, never a good idea. A lot of people along the way realized that and they thought, you know, this is where the weight is. This is where we should lift. So they grab patients by the waistband of their clothing to lift them. 
and it's effective because now we're lifting at their center of gravity. But anybody ever have a wedgie? Because that's what we're doing. We're giving our patients monster wedgies and they're moving and they're moving quick, super quick, but they're moving because we're injuring them, not because we're helping them. So don't lift with pants, don't lift by the arm, lift with a gait belt. Good? Questions? Okay. This I actually took off, this is a screenshot from another, um, another video that I found online. Do you see anything wrong with her posture? She's leaning back. So when you're lifting a patient up, when you have that gait belt, if their shoulders and arms are back here, that's exactly, you're lifting here, those shoulders and arms are gonna trail back. That's putting your patient off balance. That is not, that's gonna increase your effort, but that is not a stable position for your patient. So when you are um, lifting a patient, their hands need to be on your shoulders like that not around your neck. You don't want them to pull your head forward, but just laying loosely on your shoulders. That way they are moving as a unit and it's going to decrease the instability of your patients. So this is a new trick that they added on to the test and I don't like it. I understand the need for it, but I don't like it. For the test, they now will put something in your pathway before you start this skill, usually a table. And they're going to tell you um, where to walk your patient. So let's say that you get this skill and you're going to walk a patient. As the evaluator, I would tell you to walk to the camera and back. Okay, so now you have a defined path. But before you start that skill, I'm going to put the table in your way. I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to put the table there. And then I'm going to tell you, walk the patient to the camera and back. You are required to look around and see that that table is in your way before you stand that patient up. Because once you stand that patient up, you have to leave them to move the table. Or you have to maneuver the patient around the table. Both of which are unsafe actions. Does that make sense? So you need to look in your environment for anything that might be placed in the way of where you're told to walk. Okay. I don't like, I think it's sneaky. I don't like it, but I understand the need for it. This is why they don't put me in charge. All right, so this is a pretty easy skill overall, five minutes. We're gonna do our opening. We're going to put our gait belt on, make sure our patient has shoes on, their feet are flat on the floor, stand them up, let them acclimate, walk five steps one direction, turn around, walk five steps back, make sure that you are behind the patient and your focus is on the patient. Let them lead at their own pace. Make sure there's no obstacles before you stand them up. Bring them back to the chair, make sure they can feel it, Help them sit, remove the gate belt, do your closing. This is not a long skill. You have five minutes to do it. It may take two to three minutes. Not a long skill. But you need to know all of these things before I can show you the skill. So our important parts here are to make sure that you're using the gate belt properly. It goes around the patient's waist. You fasten it properly. It's snug. We check it with four fingers. We uh, make sure our patient's feet are on the floor and they have shoes on, we stand them up and ask if they're dizzy. Those are your really, really big checkpoints for this skill. Remember that we're gonna use that oblique angle and this shows you how the feet should be positioned for this particular skill, oblique angle. I had a really hard time with that graphic because I, I make all these graphics, I actually draw these. I had a really hard time with that one showing yeah showing showing those uh that position so we're going to let the patient lead walk slightly behind and to one side so here are our checkpoints for this particular skill 
We're gonna apply our gait belt while the patient is sitting around the waist over clothing. We'll check it with four fingers. We're gonna help to stand by holding on the gait belt on both sides or back. Let the patient lead, walk slightly behind in one side, holding the gait belt underhand. Ask them how they feel, assist them when standing and sitting. Don't pull that gait belt across the skin. And after we get them sitting in the chair, you want to check that body position, make sure that they're centered on the chair, their feet are on the floor, they're not hanging over, you know, do they look right? All right, so let me um, show you this one. Yeah, monitor how they feel throughout the scale. This is another one. Make sure you're controlling their descent, right? People with leg weakness, they can't sit controlled the way you can. Like I can lower myself into the chair at a controlled rate. But if I have leg weakness or any problems with my uh, knees or my muscles, I'll get to about this point and then I'm just going to like fall. So when we're helping our patients to sit you want to make sure that you have that gait belt and you're lowering them in a controlled manner because they may not have the ability to control that descent. And again, don't pull that gait belt across the skin. All right. So let me get a, a volunteer, somebody to come sit in this chair. And I'm going to walk you. All right. Let's see here. here we go. Hi, Mr. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. Fantastic. Do you feel like going for a little walk? No. no? <laughs> <laughs> Pleasant and cooperative. <laughs> um, does that sound okay? Okay, let me, I'm going to move this out of the way. I'm going to go close the curtain, wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. Just move that out of the way before I get started. Now, you really do need to close the privacy curtain for this one. A lot of students ask about that. I mean, we're walking them. Why do we have to close the privacy curtain? If he's just in a patient gown, when I stand him up, I probably need to put another patient gown on backwards as a robe. Otherwise, it's full moon over our unit. So, um, you want to make sure that you have that uh, privacy until you know what you're, you're working with here. Okay. All right. So not my first skill. I have now clean hands and I'm going to get the gate belt from my supply cabinet. All right. I see you have shoes on. Are they fastened? Well, good. I'm going to put this around your waist. Just relax for me. There we go. I'm going to put it through the first guard by the alligator teeth. And I'm going to pull it so that I can only fit four fingers. Now, do you guys see how snug that is? When I stand him up, watch how loose it becomes. So I'm going to put this through the second guard to lock it in place. All right. Are your feet flat on the floor? Yes. Okay. You're going to put your hands on my shoulders. I'm going to take uh, grab the back of the gate belt. On the count of three, we're going to stand up, and I'm going to give you a second to acclimate, okay? So one foot across. Can you bring your feet together just a little bit? Thank you. One foot perpendicular. Go ahead and put your hands up here, and on the count of three, we're going to stand. One, two, three. Feel that stability? Yes. Okay, you feel okay? Yes. Are you dizzy at all? No. Okay, whenever you're ready at your pace, go ahead and walk to the camera, and I'm going to walk slightly behind. Okay, go ahead and turn around. And we're going to walk back to the chair at your pace. Very good. Okay. Turn around so that the back of your knees hit that chair. Let me know when you can feel it. Okay. You're going to put your hands on my shoulders, and I'm going to help you sit on the count of three. One, two, three. Remove the gate belt. I'm just going to loop this around, make sure it doesn't hit the patient. All right. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No. Are you comfortable? Yes. We're going to pretend you can reach the call light. Okay. <laughs> Normally, the chair would be next to the bed, but because of the camera, I've got it out here. So here's your call light. If you need anything at all, pretend you can reach it. 
I'm going to put this back on my supply shelf. Open the curtain. Wash my hands. Make any corrections and tell the evaluator my skill is done. Thank you. Questions on that one? Questions? Okay. Let's see if I can fix this. That's a little bit better. Okay. Moving on to the last skill for today. And you will have some practice time built into today's class. Um, you will have more practice time on Wednesday. We're going to be doing respirations on Wednesday as well. I'm adding that in for Wednesday. Um, and then Monday, you'll have a little bit more practice time. Okay. So let's go to page 126. This is the longest skill we have. It is, if you look at the bottom of the page, 126, it says somebody with your level of experience should be able to do this skill within 19 minutes. I remember the one we just did was five. This is 19. It is a big skill. A lot of time. It also has a lot of steps and a lot of supplies. So it's a big skill. So we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about it, okay? What's that? All right, so our care plan at the top, page 127, tells us to give the resident a partial bed bath and a back rub. Because it says partial, it has to tell us what part. So it goes on to tell us very specifically what we're supposed to be washing. It says to wash the resident's face, neck, chest, abdomen, back, one arm and hand, with soap and water, provide a brief back rub with lotion, dress the resident in a clean hospital gown after bathing. Well, that just makes sense, right? Um, patients lying on back and center of bed can roll as directed, but it's too weak to assist in bathing. Now, this is, um, this is a really big skill. There's lots and lots of steps here. But the thing to remember about this one is right here, this square right here, partial bed bath, face to waist, front and back, face first, no soap. If you can remember that, that makes this skill a little bit easier. Face to waist, front and back, face first, no soap. Why, do, why don't you think we want to use soap on the face? Yeah, that's right. That's right. This is a washing skill, so we're going to go over washing rules really quickly. Now, we learned washing rules last week, so none of this should come as a surprise to you. But we are going to add the very last checkpoint. This is it. This is the very last thing for principles that we have to learn. We have already learned that we don't add soap to the water in the basin. That keeps the water clean for rinsing. We've already learned that we have to use a barrier to get water. We've also learned that we're going to check the water and it should feel warm, not hot, not cold, just warm. We know that the patient has to check it too. And in this case, the evaluator will also check the water. We know that um, we're gonna change that water if it gets cold or soapy. And we know that all washing rules require that we wash and rinse and dry. So far, nothing new here, right? We know that while we're doing the washing, we ought to be careful not to get our surface wet. So in this case, we're really going to use a towel because our patient is laying in bed and we don't want our sheets to get wet. So we'll use a towel under the area that we're washing. 
We know that lotion is warm and then wiped off. So all of those steps we already know, but we do need to add a new one in. And we're going to learn about the leaves method. So the leaves method is a very specific way of washing. These are a little bit big, but we're going to make them work. Okay, so what I just passed out, for those of you at home that are playing along, is just a plain square washcloth. You guys probably have one of these in the linen closet at home somewhere. Generally, they're folded in half and then in half again, and this makes them into a little square, right? All of you guys have one of these in front of you. Well, instead of looking at it as a square, I want you to look at it as a diamond. Just a little quarter turn. And if you hold the diamond with all the free edges at the top, not the folded corners, the free edges at the top, and you take this and put it in the palm of your hand in a diamond shape. You tuck the side in by your pinky and the other side in by your thumb, you now have a controlled washcloth that you can use to wipe something and fold that leaf over, which traps the contamination underneath. You now have a new cleaning surface to wipe something with. You can fold that over and trap the contamination underneath, giving you another clean surface. You can fold that over and give yourself another clean surface. And you can fold that over and give yourself another clean surface. So this one washcloth has five independent cleaning surfaces on it that does not cross contaminate. This is called the leaves method. It's just a basic square washcloth folded in fourths, held with the three corners at the top, and that gives us four very specific leaves. Now we're going to use this if we're going to be cleaning any wet body opening. A wet body opening is like eyes, nose, mouth, genitals, rectal area, wounds, rashes, sores, and incisions. So if we're going to wash any of those things, we need a way of preventing cross-contamination because remember, a wet body opening allows things out but it also allows things in. Good? So this keeps our patients safe. Questions on this? Well, if we're going to be doing partial bed bath, remember it was face to waist, front and back. So face, eyes, nose, mouth. Three of our wet body openings are right here. So we're going to use the leaves method for this skill when we're washing the face. Now, the rest of what we're washing, neck to waist, front and back, no body openings. Nothing to worry about. So we don't need the leaves method for that. We just use a regular washcloth, wring it out really well, put some soap on it, and wash. We only need the leaves method if we're washing any of those things. Questions? Good? All right, so the way this works is we have our washcloth held with our free corners at the top and our sides tucked in. We're going to wipe something and then fold that leaf over. That gives us another leaf to work with that we can wipe, and we're going to fold that leaf over, giving us another cleaning surface that we can use to wipe something, and then we'll fold that leaf over. That gives us another cleaning surface and we can fold that one over and even use the back if we need it, which we will on Wednesday. Okay. So for today, partial bed bath, we have two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. So I'm going to need four leaves. I always do the nose last because boogers. You know, I just 
do that last. Okay. So let's look at this care plan one more time here. It says to give the resident a partial bed, bath, and back rub. I'm going to stop there for a second. Back rub. Guys, we are not massage therapists. We are not deep tissuing anything. This, that's not what this is about. This is a very brief back rub to help promote circulation and provide comfort. When you were a little kid, when you got sick, mom probably came along, rubbed your back just a little bit like this, and it probably made you felt that, made you feel a little bit better. You were cared about and cared for. That's what we're doing here, guys. We're just helping our patients feel cared about and cared for, okay? Don't put too much thought into that. Wash the resident's face, neck, chest, abdomen, back, one arm and hand with soap and water. Provide a brief back rub with lotion. Dress the resident in a clean hospital gown. Resident's lying on back and center of that ink and roll is directed but cannot help with bathing. So I'm going to take you through the steps of this because it is such a long skill. So we're going to dissect each step and I'm going to show you that you already know almost all of these steps. Okay, so we're going to go through all of the steps, and then I'll show you the video for it. So this, you're actually going to get taught kind of twice. I'm going to go through the steps individually, and then we're going to put it all together in a video. This is a big day. These are the two hardest skills to learn. Denture care and partial bed bath. These are the two hardest skills to learn. Hairy care is kind of hard to learn, but you already know all the steps of that. And once you learn how to do the leaves method, that's all you really need to know. So Perry Care, we're going to put together everything that we've learned to this point. We'll do that on Wednesday. That's not nearly as hard as partial bed bath because there's just so much to cover in partial bed bath. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is our opening. Knock, knock, knock. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA. I'm going to give you a partial bed bath. Is that okay? Patient will be pleasant and cooperative and say yes. Now, this is going to be done on a mannequin. You're still going to talk to the mannequin like she's a real person, and the evaluator is going to answer for the mannequin. So you will get an answer. Once we have closed the curtain and washed our hands, we're going to go get our supplies. What do we get first? The barrier. The barrier. So we're going to put a barrier on the table and then go get our supplies. That's a lot of supplies, guys. It's a lot of supplies. you got to learn them. There's no way around it. You have to memorize your supplies. But let's try to make this make sense, right? It's a washing skill. So right off the bat, we know we need something to hold water. We need some washcloths. We need some towels. I need soap and lotion. Our patient is uncovered, so I'm going to need a privacy blanket. And our care plan told us to dress the resident in a clean gown afterwards, so I need one of those. Um, I know I'm going to be working around wet body openings, so I have to have gloves. some gloves. There it is. Those are all your supplies. Try to make it make sense. Okay, good. Easy way to remember washcloths. Here's a trick. If you're washing a body, a small body part, like a hand or a foot, just one hand or one foot, like hand care, foot care, you need two washcloths, one to wash, one to rinse. Everything else for the test requires four. So hand care, foot care, two. Everything else, four. Good. So we got our supplies. Now we need some water. Can I touch that uh, faucet? What do I need? Paper towel. Paper towel. What should the water feel like? Warm. Warm. Who gets to check it? The patient. the patient. You already know this, guys. You already know this. I know it's a lot of steps, but I'm showing you you already know them. Okay. Um, we have to protect the sheets with a towel because, remember, our surface can't get wet. And I need to untie that gown. So let's do those both at the same time. We can lean the patient forward. We can untie the gown and spread the towel out. Easy. We're going to do them both at the same time. During bathing, the patient's going to be undressed. So what do we need? Privacy blanket. We're going to put it on over the sheet and pull it down underneath. 
we should be doing all of this before we put on our gloves. Why? First thing your gloves should touch is the, not the supplies. You starting to put those pieces together? Okay. Okay, oops. Let me go back here. Oh, yeah, we need gloves because we're going to be cleaning the eyes, nose, mouth, and personal skin. Yeah. Okay. Um, we want to wring washcloths out thoroughly. Guys, there's nothing worse than being in bed, having somebody bathe you, and having a drippy, wet, floppy washcloth. So you need to wring your washcloths out really well. You don't want them drippy. And you want to control your washcloth at all times. And that's what that leaves method does is it keeps that washcloth from being all floppy everywhere. No drippy, wet washcloths. We don't want to put soap on the face. So soap stings the eyes. It also dries out the skin, so no soap on the face. We're going to use that leaves method on wet body openings, specifically the eyes, nose, mouth. And we're going to start out by wiping the eye from inner to outer corner. So, remember, no soap, no drippy wet washcloths. So all we did was take a washcloth, bring it out real well, hold it in the leaves method, and wipe the eye inner to outer corner. We're going to fold that leaf over and move to the other eye, inner to outer corner. Okay, good. Then wipe the face. I go to the nose last because I'm going to fold that leaf over. Remember, the nose is a doorway in, so you want to use those leaves method. So you're going to see one leaf, two leaves, three leaves, fourth leaf. And that's what this is showing now. So wash the rest of the face with another leaf and the nose last. We're going to set that washcloth aside. It's got boogers on it. You don't want to put that back in the basin. So we want to get rid of that one. But because we rinse something, we have to dry. This is the step that gets missed the most on this scale. People will wipe the face with water, but they'll forget to go back and dry it. Try not to forget this. When you're drying, keep control over your towel. You'll actually see the way I do this. If I've got a towel, this is just a, a smaller version of a towel. But when I'm drawing with a towel, I'll hold it in my hand, wrap it around my hand like this. So I actually make like a little mitt to dry. Again, you don't want sloppy corners everywhere. Now, if missed, is that correctable by verbal? Mm -hmm. And even if you, it's not a... It's not a critical checkpoint, but it's something that, you know, you just want to think about. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to wash, rinse, and dry the torso. Remember, it says chest, neck, chest, abdomen, side, one arm, and hand. So we're not washing the other side. Do we care why? No, no we don't care. Care plan said we're, that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to do. We really don't care. It may be missing. Could be amputated, gone. It may be that they're having a test on it later today that's affected by soap and lotion and deodorant, so we don't want to go anywhere near it. I don't know what the situation is. All I know is we're going to follow that care plan. So we're going to wash under the chin, across the neck, down the chest, to the abdomen, up the side, down the arm, the hand, and back up the arm. I always end at the armpit because do right? Whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. You already know this. Remember, we always want to support the arm from below when we lift it. That elbow has to be supported. I've got to lift that arm to get the underneath clean and to get to the armpit. Make sure you're supporting at that elbow. Then we're going to change it down because we got a clean body. So we're going to take the old gown off, put the new gown on, so that after we turn the patient to wash, rinse, and dry the back, the gown is already there, and all we have to do is tie it. It's a time-saving. 
So we're going to turn the patient onto the side, but in order to turn somebody onto their side, what do you have to have them do first? Scoot toward me. We already know this because patient has to remain in the middle of the bed. There's nothing new here, guys. Nothing new. Then we're going to wash, rinse, and dry the back. We'll give a brief back rub with lotion for circulation and comfort. We're going to warm that lotion first. Don't just squirt cold lotion on your patient. They will jump two feet <laughs> off that bed. And anytime you put lotion on, what do you have to do? Okay. Wipe off the excess. Yep. While we have them on their side, we'll go ahead and tie that down, put them back onto their back in the middle of the bed. Now, this is where you're going to struggle, right here. This is where you're going to struggle. Because now you got the bath done. Patient's in a gown. You're happy. You're in speedy, let's get this skill done mode now. First thing you're going to want to do is take off that privacy blanket. If you take that blanket off, you have to pull that sheet up. Because remember, your patient can't be uncovered. Your gloves have just been all up in everything. Can you touch that sheet with those gloves? No. No. You have to have gloves on to take care of your towels and your washcloth and your basin because you can't touch that without gloves. So right now you need to put your patient on their back in the middle of the bed and leave them alone. Go take care of everything else. Go put your washcloths and towels in dirty linen, your patient gown in dirty linen. Go clean your basin, uh, dry it, get your supplies and store everything. Once you've got the barrier off the table, everything is cleaned up, then you can remove your gloves. This is the step right here that everybody gets all tangled up in because they want to get that privacy blanket off and get the patient buttoned up. You can't do that yet. Does that make sense? You guys understand why? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to dispose of everything. Don't place linens on the floor. You already know that. We're going to clean and store our supplies. We already know how to do that too. And then we can remove the gloves. That's when we'll remove the privacy blanket and put it into soiled linen. Then we're going to perform our closing. So you guys understand the steps involved here? Okay. And again, these are, you have this in your book. But these are the skill-specific steps. And when you're in here practicing, remember that we have them here as well for you guys to play with. Okay, good. Any questions? I'm going to show you this skill. The state test tells you that you, somebody with your level of experience should be able to do this in 19 minutes or less. My video is less than 13 minutes. So it doesn't take nearly as long as they say that it should, or that somebody with your level of experience will have to do it. You can do it in less time. There's no problem with that on the test. You can even take more time on the test. We're gonna talk about skills timing after this video, okay? Let me show you this video. Uh -oh. um, Caitlin, can you please put the video for uh, partial bed bath? Can you load it for me, please? Caitlin? Give me just a minute, guys.
hear me. I don't know if you can hear me. So I don't have this one up online. Jones, my name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? Good. I need to do partial bed bath. Is that okay? I'm going to close your curtain. Let me wash my hands, get my supplies, and I'll be right back. For this skill, I'm going to need a barrier for the table. This will give me a clean place to put my clean supplies. For this skill, I will need four washcloths two towels, a clean gown, and a privacy blanket. It's a washing skill, so I will also need a basin, soap, and lotion. And I'll need a set of gloves. Ms. Jones, let me go get some water. I'll be right back. Ms. Jones, is this water appropriate temperature? Okay. And now I'm going to spread the privacy blanket out over you. This will help keep you warm and protect your privacy while we do this skill. I'm going to spread the blanket without snapping or shaking the blanket. And I'm going to pull your sheet down to about your waist. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm going to ask you to sit forward for me in just a moment so I can untie your gown. And I'm going to spread this towel out underneath you to keep your sheets dry while we bathe you. Can I assist you to sit up, please? Thank you. I'm going to untie your gown and spread the towel out on the bed. Go ahead and lay back down, Ms. Jones. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to spread the towel out underneath the arm. I'll remove the gown on the side closest to me, supporting the elbow as I lift it. And I'm going to relocate the gown to the other side of the patient. This leaves the patient uncovered underneath the privacy blanket for bathing. The blanket will keep you warm. Now I can apply my gloves. I'll take the first washcloth and wring it out. And I'm going to use four corners. We'll wash the face first, no soap on the face. Ms. Jones, I'm going to wash your eyes. I'll start with the closest eye to me. I'm going to wash from the inner to outer corner. Very gently. And then we'll fold this leaf over to prevent contamination from spreading to the other eye. Ms. Jones, I'm going to wash your other eye now, inner to outer corner. We'll fold that leaf over, and then I'm going to wash the remainder of the face. 
using very gentle strokes and keeping control over the washcloth. We'll fold that leaf over and use the final washcloth for the nose. And then we'll set that aside. I'm going to take the towel and pat dry all areas of her face, making sure not to use too much force. We'll set the towel aside. We're going to take the second washcloth and wring it out. And we'll apply soap to the top leaf. We do not need to use the leaves method because all of her skin from this point is intact. We're going to wash behind the ear, under the chin, across the neck, the upper torso. We're going to lift the blanket to protect privacy but keep the patient covered while we wash down to the abdomen and up the side. Now for the exam, you are going to make sure the patient remains covered until the evaluators ask you to remove the blanket. At that point, you will just continue on. I am going to repeat these actions so that you can see what I have done. I'll remove the blanket for better visualization. Behind the ears, across the chin, the neck, the upper torso, around the breasts, down the abdomen and up the side. Then we'll clean down the front of the arm, the hand, up the back of the arm, lifting at the elbow, and the armpit last. We'll set this washcloth aside because it has soap on it. We'll take the third washcloth in the basin and wring it out. And we're going to rinse all the areas that we just washed. So behind the ear, under the chin, across the neck, the upper torso, around the breasts, the abdomen, up the side, down the front of the arm, keeping the elbow supported on the bed. We'll rinse the hand, the back of the arm, and the armpit while supporting the arm. The rinse washcloth can go back in the basin for later use. Now we're going to dry all of those areas. So we're going to pat dry or use short soft strokes, but nothing vigorous. Go ahead and lift your arm, Ms. Jones. We'll set the towel aside. Now the patient has a clean torso, so we'll place the clean gown on her. Ms. Jones, can you reach your arm through here? I'll help you put your gown on. We'll lift the arm at the elbow, supporting it as we lift. And we'll spread the gown out. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm going to go around to the other side of the bed now, and we'll dress the other arm. Since the care plan said that we only needed to wash one arm, we do not need to cleanse this other arm. That's per the care plan, but we do need to dress it. So I'll remove the soiled gown and we're going to place this in dirty linen. And then I'll put the new gown on. Ms. Jones, can you reach through this armhole? Thank you. And go ahead and lift. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm going to ask you to turn on to your left side now. This is going to allow me to wash your back and give you a brief back rub. So I'm going to ask you to scoot toward me, and we're going to roll you onto your left side. Ready? Go ahead and scoot toward me. One, two, three. Now the evaluator will hold the mannequin in place while you complete your cleaning. So I'm going to take the third washcloth, bring it out and we'll soap the top leaf. I'm going to wash the back of the neck, the shoulders, and the back down to the waist. We'll set that washcloth 
the side. We'll take the final washcloth and wring it out. And we're going to rinse all of those areas. The back of the neck, the shoulders, and the back down to the waist. And then finally, it will dry all of those areas. The back of the neck, neck and the shoulders, the back down to the waist. Now our care plan asks us to give the patient a brief back rub. So we're going to use a little bit of lotion, making sure to warm the lotion in our hands before we give them a back rub. Ms. Jones, I'm going to give you a little back rub now. I'm going to start at the small of your back and work my way up in small circles to your shoulders. We'll do this three times. This is for circulation purposes. One, two, one more, and three. I'm going to wipe off the excess lotion. Now I can tie the patient's gown. And remove the towel that's protecting the linens. Ms. Jones, come on back onto your back, please. And scoot to to the middle of the bed. Thank you. I do not want to touch that sheet that's going to go right up next to her face with soiled gloves, but I need my soiled gloves to take care of all of my dirty linens. Miss Jones, I'll be right back. These items are going to go into dirty linen. Now I'm going to go clean the basin. I'll empty the basin and rinse it. And then pick it up with a paper towel. I'll dry the inside with one paper towel and throw it away. And then dry the outside with a paper towel and throw that away and I'll get one for the drawer. I'll collect the soap and the lotion, placing them in the basin, and return the basin to its drawer for storage. Paper towels can be thrown away. This barrier is going to be discarded, and now I can remove my gloves. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm going to remove your privacy blanket now and pull your sheet back up. Are you comfortable? Good. We're going to roll the privacy blanket in a ball so that the trailing edges don't contaminate other surfaces. This will be placed in dirty linen. Okay, Ms. Jones, is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here, such as a magazine? No? Okay, here's your call light. If you should need anything at all, please let me know. I'm going to open the privacy curtain and wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll think about the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and tell the evaluator my skill is done. Any questions on that? A partial bed bath? It was better visually. Mm -hmm. What's that? It made me feel easier about it visually. Good. Good. Did it help to review all the steps before I showed you the, the video? Sure. Okay. I think the supplies is the most intimidating part about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and memorizing the supplies of all the skills is probably one of the harder tasks that you have to do. The best advice I can give you is try to make it make sense. All washing skills require the same things. Towels, washcloths, basin, soap, lotion. Um, what about the clean gown? Like you touched the dirty, dirty gloves with the clean gown. 
Yeah, and that, that's okay. Remember that there's no way to do this without some cross transfer. Right. The patient is still on the sheets. You know, we got a clean patient, but the sheets aren't clean. Right. So there's, there's always a point of crossover. We're just trying to do as clean as possible. Um, that, that's really what we're, we're focusing on is as clean as possible. Yeah, I, I noticed like when you were touching the sheet to lift it and stuff like that, you're still touching it with your gloves, but it's like, right. what else can you do? Yeah, it's it, there, there's always a crossover point. Yeah. I think my battery is dead on my... All right. I yes. have a question. Yes. Um, they don't teach you how to wash their hair, if like for example when they're in the hospital, when you're working for the hospital? So um, chapter seven that you're going to be reading tonight in your book, will go over that. No. Um, it's not something that's on the test and it's not something I'm going to teach you. Every facility is gonna handle that a little bit different and every patient is gonna get that handled yeah. a little bit different. Um, we have shampoo caps that we put on and just add just a little bit of water and, and massage it looks like a shower cap but the shampoo is in it um we also have inflatable basins that go on the bed that like underneath think of it like a shampoo bowl but more square that goes on the bed some facilities use those um some patients you know will get their hair washed in the shower when they're in the shower so every patient is going to be handled a little differently every facility is going to handle a little differently based on the supplies that they have so once they can get up from the bed, so they can't move. They, they can't patients. move yeah. or they can't. So they can't. Yeah. Again, every it, that's going to be handled based on the facility. Mm -hmm. Not every not every facility has shampoo caps. Mm -hmm. Not every facility has a inflatable um, hair basin. So every place is going to handle it a little bit different. But I will tell you that. There's a difference between short-term care, acute care hospitals, mm -hmm. and long-term care, okay? In a hospital, if the patient is stuck in bed, we're probably going to use a basin. I have used yeah. a regular bath basin to wash somebody's hair. Mm -hmm. It takes a little bit of work, but you can make it happen. Make sure that you protect the bed, because it's gonna get wet. But in long-term care, even patients that are bed-bound, like her right she's not getting up but even patients like her we still get them to the shower room once a week usually because we have a stretcher a shower stretcher it's uh, got mesh on it so we put the patient on the shower stretcher take them down to the shower room and shower them there so that is probably in long-term care where your patients are going to get their hair washed. Good? Some nursing homes and assisted living facilities have a hair salon right on premises and they get their hair done at the salon. So every place is gonna handle this different, every patient is gonna be handled different it really depends on is it short-term care, long-term care, what supplies do we have, and what is the level of need for our patients. You know, some nursing homes have like the shower team where that's all they do all day. Yes, yes. Shower team is all about showers. Yeah. Good? Mm -hmm. Questions? All right, let's go to page 71. I don't have any slides on this. I forgot to make the slides for this, but let me explain to you how skills timing works. I told you that this skill, partial bed bath, you have 19 minutes to perform it. If you do it a little bit quicker, that's fine. Even if you take a little longer, that's fine because your timing for the test is not based on um, the individual skills. So if we have this skill set that you are assigned to do, okay, so 
Lindy gets skill set 10. Her skills are measure, record, pulse, perform passive range of motion to elbow and wrist, and provide a partial bed bath to a resident in bed. So two of the skills that we learned today, plus pulse. So those are the three skills that you have to perform. The evaluator is going to read the care plan to you. And before she gives it to you, she's going to say you have 36 minutes to perform this skill set. So your time starts not when they give you this. Your time starts when you decide you're ready to start the skill. So they read this to you. They hand it to you. You get to read it on your own, and they're going to say, let me know when you're ready to start. And you'll take a deep breath, center yourself. Remember, every skill starts with an opening. Right? That's the first thing you want to say to yourself, because right now you're kind of freaking out a little bit. It's showtime, right? So remember to say to yourself, every skill starts with the opening. Every opening starts with a knock. If you can at least get that much, you'll be okay because that's your starting point, okay? Then when you are ready, you're going to say, okay, I'm ready to start. That's when your time starts. So you have 36 minutes to do these three skills. Well, how do they come up with that number, 36 minutes? That's what I want to go over with you now. Every single skill has a time associated with it. So measure, record, pulse. If you look at page 71, in that first column, you'll see a grid that has the timing for all of the skills. So how much time are they allowing you for pulse? 11. Five. Yeah, the oh. numbers in front. Oh, yeah, I know. Uh, five. I know. I'm thinking across. Yep. Five. Okay. How about range of motion? Four. So five plus four is nine. Partial bed bath? Nineteen. So nine plus nineteen is twenty-eight. I told you you had thirty-six. So where does the other time come from? Well, they're going to give you five minutes of transition time or thinking time. So you get an extra five minutes right off the top, just so that you have time to think about your supplies, to make any corrections, to, you know, transition between skills. They also give you three minutes for hand washing. <clears throat> hand washing does not count against your skill time. It's three minutes extra for hand washing built in. So if you take the 28 minutes for our three skills, you add three minutes for hand washing, that brings us to 31, and five minutes for transition time, that brings us to 36. That's how they get this number. Make sense? So... Like I said, if you get partial bed bath and you do it sooner than 19 minutes, there's no problem with that. Even if you take a little bit longer than 19 minutes, there's no problem with that too because it's not based on the skill, it's the overall time. Good? Now at 31 minutes, they're gonna give you a five minute warning. They're gonna say, hey, Lindy, five minutes. <clears throat> You've got to get as many checkpoints in in that five minutes as you can. It's not an automatic fail if you go over time. You just don't get a check mark for anything you didn't do. So anything undone, there's a deficiency. So if you get really good at the closing and kind of get through it really quick, you can get a lot of those checkpoints. Remember, half of every single checklist is the opening and the closing. Remember, that makes up half of every checklist. So get to your closing and get it done. But you do need to learn that closing backwards and forwards. So if you get into that situation where now you're having to rush, you know the steps to the closing. You can do them that quick. Okay? I can do the entire closing in less than a minute. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? Are you comfortable? Your environment is clean. Here's your call light. 
Let me know if you need anything. I'm going to open your curtain, wash my hands, document if necessary, wash my hands again, think about my skill, make any corrections. My skill is done. Less than a minute. Okay. So if you get that five-minute warning, you want to get to your closing and get it done. Because remember, your closing has a lot of check marks. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Any questions? All right, so tonight you have chapter seven to read. Chapter seven is all on skills. Some skills we do in class, other skills like hair, uh, washing hair, we don't. Um, read the ones that we aren't doing, just so you're familiar with them. But remember that most of those are going to be based on the facility you're working in and the supplies, so they're gonna train you on those there, okay? Oh, question. Debbie says, is the TED host stocking a part of Prometric skills test? Debbie, it depends on the state that you're in. Um, Prometric used to be in Texas, and Texas still ha Texas has AE stockings or TED O's um, on the test in Texas. Most other states that are that test with Prometric do not. So here in Florida, we do not have TED O's um, on our test. But I do have a video for it if you want to watch it. So I do have, I did head hose on her. Man, that, that video took me like 28 attempts to get the right camera angle and, and to get the head because she doesn't give any pressure, right? You try to pull the, the um, hose up her legs and her legs go up. So <laughs> that was, I'll tell you what, I got some serious blooper reels on that one. <laughs> and the AC went out and I'm literally sweating on the, the mannequin, you can actually see oh, it was a mess. <laughs> yeah, it took me tons and tons and tons of takes on that one. But I got it done, and it looks really good. So the video is on my website or on um, our YouTube channel if you want, wanted to watch it. But no, Debbie, it's not part of Prometric testing in most states. All right, any other questions? Any other questions? All right, remember, you've got Chapter 7 to do. When you come into class on Wednesday, we have three skills. They're going to actually go pretty quick. I have nothing left to teach you guys. I have nothing left to teach you. Everything from here on out, all of the skills that we're going to learn are just going to be repurposing the principles we've already learned. So we are going to talk about incontinence. We are going to talk about catheters on Monday. We're going to talk about a few things that are relevant to what we're learning, but the skills themselves, you already know the principles you need to perform those skills. I'm going to show you how to do them. But the learning part, pretty much done. We're just going to repurpose. So it gets easier from here. All right, so those of you uh, joining us from home, we're going to go ahead and sign off. Uh, the rest of the class will be practiced for the students, and you don't need to be here for that. So we'll sign off on, um, join us on Wednesday. We're, we've got a couple of skills we're going to do on Wednesday. Thursday will be my live, and the following Monday, we will graduate this class out, so join us for that. Um, and then we're into October already. Amazing. This year has flown by. So uh, those of you at home, if you have any questions, feel free to send them to me through any of my social media channels or uh, through my website. And I hope you enjoyed today's class. Until next time, happy caregiving. Bye.